Good afternoon, everyone. And my name is John Scott. And as a Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Scottish Parliament on the 7th Annual St Andrew's Day Debate. Today's debate and the wider competition that preceded it have been organised in partnership with Education Scotland and the English Speaking Union. And I'd like to express my thanks to those involved from both organisations for their hard work and efforts which accumulate in today's event. As most of you will know, this debating chamber here in the Scottish Parliament is the crucible of debate in Scotland, where controversial debate is welcomed alongside the occasionally, my parliamentary colleagues will forgive me, the occasionally more pedestrian debates, which are nonetheless vital to the delivery of democracy here in Scotland. And as a parliamentarian, I'm always very impressed with the extremely high standard of debating demonstrated by the finalists in this competition. I'm also a great admirer of the unique format that the St Andrews debate offers in its pairing of students from our schools and universities. And this is clearly a successful format as the contest continues to go from strength to strength. And hosting this competition provides the Scottish Parliament with an appropriate way of celebrating St Andrews Day. And as you will know, Scotland shares its patron saint with other countries such as Russia and Greece. And St Andrew's Day is marked by events and activities around the world, not just in Russia and Greece, but also in St Andrew's societies across the world, for example, in Bermuda and Washington, D.C. Closer to home, though, more and more Scottish towns and cities are using St Andrew's Day as a platform to launch winter festivals and celebrations to get us all through the cold winter months. Today, the chamber floor has been given over to some of Scotland's most talented young debaters. I wish our finalists the very best of luck and also good luck to everyone else taking part in the open debate, which we will come to later. Finally, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone in the galleries and friends and classmates, teachers and families, and to everyone watching live on GLOW TV in classrooms around the country. I hope you enjoy this afternoon's debate and your visit to the Scottish Parliament. Thank you. Now, before I introduce the finalists, I'd like to introduce the judges. Chairing the judging panel will be Ruth Davidson, MSP. As you will know, Ruth is the leader of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party in Scotland. What you may not know is that Ruth was a very successful schools debater in her day and won the Courier TSB debating competition, a prize of which was a holiday in Florida. And she's gone from strength to strength since. Kezia Dugdale is a regional MSP for Lothian. Kezia is Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning. And Kezia holds degrees from Aberdeen and Edinburgh Universities. And I'm going off piece here and is widely regarded as one of the rising stars in the Parliament. John Dye, Deputy Chair of the English Speaking Union of the Commonwealth and Treasurer of the English Speaking Union Scotland. John has over 20 years of experience judging school and university debates. And I'm happy to welcome John back to the chamber for a fourth time in assisting in this event. Stephen Gethins was a special advisor to the First Minister and is now a candidate for the upcoming European elections. Stephen is also an experienced debater hailing from Dundee University. Completing the judging panel is a student debater of note, Andrew Beverstock. Andrew is president of the Scottish Students Debating Council and is a third-year medical student at Edinburgh. I would now like to congratulate and introduce the four teams that have made it to the final. They are Matteo Catanzano from Glasgow University and Erin Sanderson from Balfron High School and will be known as Team Balfron Glasgow. We also have Declan Maxwell from Strathclyde University and Kira Mitchell from, Dundee, from the High School of Dundee. 
and will be known as Team Dundee Strathclyde. We also have Mira Ragav from St Andrews University and Ewan Redpath from Madras College, and they will be known as Team Madras St Andrews. And finally, we have Duncan Crow from Glasgow University and Max Cochran from Bearsden Academy, and they will be known as Team Bearsden Glasgow. And before we begin, I'd like to outline the format of the debate. I will call on the first proposition to speak, and they will have seven minutes. I will then call on the first opposition speaker to speak, and they also will have seven minutes. And this is repeated before we open the debate to the floor. And during these eight speeches, I will verbally announce when your first minute is up, and this will indicate that points of information are now permitted. I will also verbally indicate when you have entered your last minute. And at this point, no more points of information will be allowed. And when your seven minutes are up, I will ask you to wind up. And if you continue further, I will ask again for you to wind up after 30 seconds. As you may know, in my role as Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm tasked with keeping the members of the Scottish Parliament to time when speaking in the Chamber. And I trust this debate will follow in a similar fashion. And please do use the clocks around the chamber for reference, as these will be timing you. After the final speech for the opposition, I will ask the judges to retire to make their decision. And at this point, I will open the debate up to the floor for 15 minutes. I hope that everyone possible will participate in the floor debate, and there will be an award for the best contribution from the floor. And so the motion today is, this House believes that a good dictatorship is better than a bad democracy. So now on to the final, and I wish all of you the best of luck. So I'd like to begin, I'd like to call the first speaker from Team Balfron Glasgow to open the debate as the first proposition speaker. And you have seven minutes, please. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, sorry, fellow judges and distinguished audience. First of all, I'd just like to say it's an honour to speak in Parliament. And I'd also like to thank and congratulate um, the, um, the gentleman who've, who's just introduced me because few managed to say my name correctly the first time round. So congratulations. But let's talk about democracy and dictatorship, ladies and gentlemen. And here I'd like to clarify what we mean by this, OK? Because... A good democracy is not, sorry, a, a bad democracy is not the same as a democracy, in the same way that a dictatorship is not the same as a bad dictatorship. So what we mean here by a bad democracy, it's a democracy where the democratic principles no longer apply. It's a democracy where the vote is not respected. It's a democracy where its elected representatives are unable to, um, are carrying out their own self-interest and not the interest of the people for which um, they were elected. And by a good dictatorship, we mean an individual um, followed by a panel of experts um, who may be a technocrat himself, who, is, who makes decisions on behalf of a society and in the interests of that society. Okay. So first, um, yes, sir. Are you saying that if China was to start casting votes, albeit with only one political party, it would suddenly count as a democracy under your equation, even if there's no ability to track preferences from the people in that society to the way the government goes about doing its outcome? And for all intents and purposes, it's the exact same as under the status quo, where it is a dictatorship. No. So we think that, um, that we would still... So under our model, you would have, um, you, you would have one ruler that would, um, that, that would go on to to act as a dictator in the case where um, the democratic principles aren't, aren't, um, aren't upheld. Okay? So we think that China is a bit of a difficult example because it calls itself a democracy when it really, in fact, isn't. Okay? Um, so I'll bring you three points today, ladies and gentlemen. I'll bring you, first of all, the role of the state. I'll secondly bring you um, the, the, the idea of the, the legitimacy of the dictator. And third of all, the harms of group coercion that you, that you get under bad democracies. Okay? So, as an example, I'd like to, so for instance, in Italy, when you had um, the Berlusconi as, as a prime minister, the problem was that he accumulated so much power and so, so much political and economic capital that he no longer cared for what the people thought. 
Now, we think that's particularly damaging when there are no structures in place that can counter that. There are no competing power structures that are able to modulate and to, ho to hold them accountable for his actions, okay? We think that at this point, someone else needs to step in. That's when we need a benevolent dictator. We need someone to step in to take the role that uh, this bad democracy previously had, right? And we think that a technocratic government, for instance, in this case, is not only necessary, but is also preferable, ladies and gentlemen. So we think that in the case of, um, of, our, of our technocratic government, why is it important? Because fundamentally, the role of the state is to protect and to provide for its people, okay? They will come on this side of the house and tell us that the state is there to provide freedom for its members, that it's there to provide these abstract values that, that, pro that the opposition will, 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 will propose. We don't think that's true. We think that fundamentally the state is there to make sure that you live, ladies and gentlemen. It's there to provide you with food, to provide you with the space and the freedom to act within certain structures. And we think that in some cases, you need one person that knows what's best for you. Sometimes we don't think that the individual is best placed to make his own decisions. And we think that the, the, the panel of experts will, bet, will be better placed to, um, to, to, make, to make these important decisions about your life um, even if you don't directly have a say in them, okay? Why would you think that is? We think that, first of all, um, dictatorships have institutional memory. We think that over time, they're able to, they're, they're able to um, notice patterns and to aggregate um, different experiences of people. They're able to aggregate um, repeated preferences. And with that, they're then able to make better informed decisions um, about the nature of their populace, right? We think that, secondly, by employing experts, you're not going to get cases where individuals who know nothing about healthcare, who know nothing about engineering or about energy, start making uninformed decisions about these different policies, right? So we think it's much better when you can ask a panel that knows exactly what's going on, that has um, access to databases, to different resources, but also to advanced knowledge to solve the problems of today's society. We think that when you have a technocratic government that takes over from Berlusconi and starts solving Italy's economic problems, we think that that's when you can start to develop. And we think that only then can you then, uh, only once the problems have been resolved, can you reinstore potentially a good democracy, right? But we think that a bad democracy doesn't achieve that. Why? Because what you get in a bad democracy is essentially the preferences of the people don't get listened to. And you just get a perpetuation of the aggregation of power and resources from those in power that are fundamentally dictators, but very bad dictators, ladies and gentlemen. And what do they do? They hide under the veil of democracy, okay? And we think that's particularly pernicious because then we are unable to remove them when their time is over. What we do is we can't challenge them, and unlike the benevolent dictator, we can't say your time here is done, your work is finished, we will reinstate the democracy, okay? And secondly, I'd like to talk about um, society as a whole and why dictators are best placed to match the interests of the whole of society and not just the individual. We think that when you have powerful groups, whether they're government groups or other lobby groups, that are able to stand up and say, we want this from my group, especially in, especially in bad democracies where voter apathy and other factors come into play, other factors that mean that, votes, that, that you're less likely to vote, but even that if you're likely to vote, One you're likely to be coerced into voting. Um, we think that's particularly bad because what happens then is that you don't, the, the, the choices that get made by the government are not in the best interest of society. What happens then is that you get these lobby groups that just aggregate more political capital, more power, and end up bludgeoning the people, okay? We think that in, in this particular instance, it's better to have a group that is unbiased, that is objective, that is able to make decisions in a way that doesn't coerce, that doesn't harm, and that doesn't damage particular groups. We think that in a bad democracy, that's likely to happen, because as I've said, you would have um, an aggregation of power by a small number of people. Okay. So what have I told you so far, ladies and gentlemen? I've told you that the state has a role to protect and provide for its people. I've told you why the state is best placed to make these decisions, and why in a bad democracy it's better to have a good dictatorship. Um, I've also told you that in the case of, of a bad democracy, you will get the coercion of certain groups by other groups with more political capital. Should and close now, capital. please. Okay. So for all these reasons, I beg you to propose a motion. Many thanks. Well done. I now call on the first speaker from Team Dundee, Strathclyde, to respond as the first opposition speaker. You have seven minutes, please. Ladies and gentlemen, even if a democracy breaks down, 
Once they've had it, people have the idea that they're entitled to democracy and therefore fight for it. We think the reason that France has had five revolutions isn't because they like fighting and kill killing each other on streets. It's because after having democracy once, they're inspired to fight for it again. And we think this idea is fundamental to the, like, really, the way that this motion is really, really flawed. And I'm going to be proving that to you in my case today by looking at two main areas. First of all, I'm going to do comparative analysis between the different scenarios and prove to you um, why bad democracy is much, much better. And then I'm go on, going to go on to prove to you how bad democracies evolve into good uh, democracies and why that's better in the long run and benefits everybody. OK, but before I move on to my substantive case, um, I'd like to deal with some rebuttal. OK, so we were told by first proposition about how like, a bad democracy is one where they don't uphold democratic principles, like and the vote isn't respected. And we think the key thing here is that like, there is a vote. And we think when you have that, that's then a mechanism for, uh, like, for um, initiating change in the long term and providing like, a platform from which things can get better and things can progress. So actually we think like that's a platform for which things can get better and that's what's really fundamental to like the nature of the democracies they're talking about. And then like in their mech um, like, we think there's a problem with their mech in that we think on side opposition, oh, thank you, say, like, all dictators call themselves democracies. Like, North Korea hold votes. There might be only one party to vote for, but they still do it. So there's no kind of examples of this mysterious dictatorship they believe in because it doesn't exist. Because when you get to the point of being a technocratic dictator, you work on the principle that you know best. Like, if this good dictator cared as much about the people as side proposition want to think they did, they wouldn't be a dictator in the first place, like, because, because then they're not, like, respecting the people's choices and whatever. So we don't actually agree with the, like, the false dichotomy which side proposition bought us which we don't buy into about the two scenarios which we were actually having to engage with in our case and they talked about like how this is better for everyone and stuff we think like good dictatorships like to bad dictatorships because the mechanisms of power in the, are fixed within that country which then don't don't lead away with which progression can happen we think when the power structures are fixed that's really dangerous and we think otherwise like bad democracy leads to good, a good democracy by contrast by empowering the people and providing a mechanism by which they can change because they have like a means of expression to say to say that they want things to be different and we think this is what's really, really important. OK, so on to my main case, but looking at like, the difference between the scenarios. So let's consider the nature of a bad democracy, first of all. Because we think that the implementation of democracy in any form provides a mechanism for long-term change and progress within that country. So, for example, really to Kenya. Like, this is an example of a bad long-term democracy. We think there's lots of racial tensions and election misconduct. However, we think there's more hope for this if they have a democratic system um, through, through which they can like, hope to develop. Because we think like, the method of representation has been refined through violent revolution, through the voice of the people, and not through like, a good dictator being nice to everyone and trying to fix things, which they don't think they actually do. Um, so we think this is better than the alternative. So let's look at the natures of these like good dictatorships. So we think that in terms of good dictatorships, we think there's two possible ways in which these um, people can maintain their power. And I'm going to look at them both and prove to you why both ways are really, really dangerous. OK, so first of all, is maintaining their power through like, like a bargain. We think this is like the best form. And we think this bargain system is for the able to provide money for their citizens, like low taxes, like good services, to keep them happy that way and therefore maintain their power balance. So the example of this is like oil-rich Arab nations, which are very undemocratic, but keep people happy through money. So why is this bad? Okay, so we think it's very unreliable. Like, oil price prices fluctuate, and therefore we think, like, what happens when this government can no longer afford, like, the bargains and the low taxes and all the services they're giving to their people and, like, can't afford their secret police? No, thank you. We think this leads to anarchy or makes anarchy more likely, and that makes the system within that country really, really, um, really unstable, which is bad for everybody. Um, and we think like even more, even more corrupt d democracies are better because there is this potential for change in the way that a bargain democracy can't facilitate because the power structures are fixed and there's nothing that goes to the people. OK, so second, the second way which um, dictators can keep their power is through like, strong mil relying on strong military powers. So like inflicting powers of the military. We think inside opposition that having lots of people with guns instigating laws like this is a crucible for coups which lead to worse dictatorships and like a spiral downwards because this instigates worse situations by like the ways in which the laws are being enforced in that country being like really, really violent. We think like um, even good dictatorships have an overinflated um, uh, militaries, which um, this, this exists as like a real problem. And we think that that's something which side proposition didn't take into account when they told you about this ideal good, uh, like a uh, good dictatorship. Because so, for example, we think like early China was like the worst form of dictatorship, like because. Um, because they prioritised like Han Chinese, which led to sectarian violence, etc., etc. We think like they repressed the people to the point of no voice. We think at the point of having no voice. We think that the revolution happened through the introduction of democratic ideals, which facilitated change, and we think that's a process which keeps continuing and which democracy is really essential to. OK, so secondly, moving on to this idea about like, how democracy, how bad democracies evolve into good democracies. 
So we think dem democracy evolves in two different ways. I'm going to look at both of them and prove to you why in both scenarios our side is the best. Okay, so first of all, we think they can evolve on the premise that they're necessarily dependent upon the division of power amongst a few individuals who compete, so like cabinet members. Okay, so what this does is create a system where a small amount of people have to compete to at least in part provide citizens with what they want. This, like, we think this kind of acts as like a snowball rolling down a hill idea, where like it gathers force and momentum as support increases, which is really effective mechanism for change if democracy develops in this way. Because we think as people get things and um, like expect other people to give to them and they don't want those rights taken away, which is really essential to the development of a country where people don't have like I don't, don't have things provided for them. And we think this puts pressure on governments to, to become more democratic. So, for example, we think like the, re, the recent hereditary hierarchical system within the House of Lords was removed by what we consider like a good democracy. We think that like, if we buy their definition of a good democracy, like Britain wasn't one because like the House of Lords, what happens in that exists. And the way to fix this, um, it wasn't isn't to appoint, appoint a good dictator who has like the best interests at heart to change one things to, make, to maximise democracy. Um, but to get it through the paths of democracy, which are created by a system which facilitates the voice of the people above all else. And we think this is really important in the characterisation of what we think a democracy represents and why that's really important. Okay, so the second way we think a democracy can um, devolve is like the creation of a constitution. And we think this is a really good thing as well. Because we think when it has this, it sets down the rules which then rulers like aren't allowed to um, break, like the American constitution. We think this creates like um, psychological ideals of everyone to be entitled to certain things which can't then be removed. And this then provides them with a safety net um, like to give them rights um, to give them rights and the faith in the faith in the government because there are these things which can't be denied and we think all these kind of prin principles are like applicable like to democracy um, like de um, regardless of like w whether it's particularly efficient or not because we think the thing is that it facilitates change in the future and allows this country to move forward and we're perfectly happy to accept that on a balance of harm like even if things are worse at the moment if that leads to like really really great benefits Should in the long run now, we think please. that's a really really good thing so ladies and gentlemen we think when Cromwell killed, uh, killed Charles um, and disposed him as king of England and created a higher, hierarchical monarchy instead of the republic he promised. Because the people had already um, had democracy, they felt entitled to it. That's why they fought for it. That's why we ended up with the system we had today. For all these reasons and the reason my partner will tell you, I'm very proud to oppose. Well done. And I now uh, call the second proposition speaker from Team Balfron, Glasgow, to give us their views. Uh, Aaron Sanderson, you have seven minutes, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chair, we as a proposition believe that a good dictatorship is far better than a bad democracy. I would like to follow on in my main speech from some of the points that Matteo made about what a good dictatorship is and what a bad democracy is, but also I'd like to focus on the, in the democracy part about how, about how a dictator is informed by experts and has access to databases and, ex, um, and experts, like I said, which might give them facts and objectives, which means they can make the right decision for the benefit of the people. And in the bad democracy, I'll be focusing on how people, the problem in a bad democracy is the fact that people don't vote. And when people don't vote, as we're well aware, it means that we're not getting the views of the people. And if we're not getting the views of the One people, minute. then technically it is not a government of the people, by, for the people, by the people. But firstly, I'd like to move on to some rebuttal. Um, the opposition, um, first of all, made the point about how a bad democracy can turn into a good democracy. But there's two questions I would like to actually, or two points I would like to make about that. Firstly, how are you proposing? Like, how does this happen? We can't, what the motion is saying is that a good dictatorship is better than a bad democracy. So what we have to focus on here is the bad democracy, not on a bad democracy that can be turned into a good democracy. And secondly, about how in a bad democracy, the problems the problem that would arise is the fact that people would not air their views. And then how is it going to be, as I said, a government that is of the people if we do not have the views of the people? Because this is just the fundamental basic that we need in a democracy. And this is what the bad democracy would be missing. So what I would really like to make very clear is the difference between a dictatorship, a bad dictatorship, and between a democracy and a bad democracy. 
Now, obviously, we have this view that dictatorships are bad because so far, not many have worked out. But what this motion is saying is that if a good dictatorship is what would be presented. So in a good dictatorship, as I said, I want to speak about how the dictator would be well educated would have act and would have access to a lot of information, whether this was through databases or experts. Um, yes, please. What happens when that fantabulously educated mystical di dictator dies? Well, then, then obviously there would be plans in place for somebody to take over who would, run the country, who would run the country just the way that the previous dictator had already done. So, as I said before, this dictator would be well educated and would have access to lots of information through databases and experts. Now, this means they would have facts and objectives. So, with this, it means they could make the right decisions. So why is this good dictatorship with someone who has all this information, why is it better than when we get information from our people? Well, firstly, as I said before, it reflects fact and objectives, not just opinion. And also, it's opposed, it's opposed to the views. It's the difference between that and getting views from people who are not actually willing to express them. So also, in a, democ in a bad democracy... A lot of the time, the people are given, are making the wrong decisions because they have been wrongly informed. Now, this is not only bad, because not only are we getting the views of people that sometimes are not well informed, but also quite a lot of the time, we're not getting views from the people, a majority group of people at all, which means that actually, we are not having a government by the people because the people are not expressing their views, and this is what it is in a bad democracy. In a, in a bad democracy, um, others, they don't take other people's interests and ideas into account. A lot of the time, the decisions are made by small groups of people who take the majority of the vote, and sometimes people's views and opinions are left out. Yes, please. Um, OK, so why does holding elections not serve as a mechanism for change in the future? Because what I'm saying here is in a bad democracy, which is what the motion is saying, is that people would not vote, and then in the elections, no change could be made because we would not have the views of the people who are voting in this election. And this is kind of leading me on to my second point. Oh, no, thank you. Um, this, the problem is that people wouldn't vote, and as I've said this, and this could mean, and this means that they don't have all the information, which means that the decisions can sometimes be based on the minority. So, even if they had the info, the decisions can be less likely to actually benefit the whole of the public because these people have, as I said, been ill-informed and are not aware of all the facts. Whereas in a good dictatorship, it means that the person has been informed through, through facts and objective, but also through people who have high morals and who actually know what they're talking about, experts. Which means that this, and this means that they have the right information to make beneficial decisions and to run the country in a good way. But, um, what, yeah, what we are, so what I'm going to try to see here is um, also in a bad democracy, also just in society in general, quite a lot of the time, other people can influence certain people's decisions. The, but in a bad democracy, t definitely, if we are being given given bad One information minute. by people who are not educated in the subject, then technically it can influence them. And then this is actually becomes the point where there is no longer a democracy. So I would just like to quickly recap all the points I've, kind of, I've made. And the first one is about a good dictatorship, having a good dictator who has high morals, and it means that he has the access to all the right information to make well-educated decisions for the benefit of his country and his people, or her. And, um, and I want to make, and this means, but this is contrasting to obviously the bad democracy where a lot of people's uh, in, uh, views are not being taken into account due to the fact they are not voting. And this is what we're seeing by the bad democracy. And because they are not voting, we don't get their views. And that is just what I really wanted to make clear. So just to sum up as a whole, um, I've made clear the difference between the bad democracy and a good now, dictatorship. Please. And um, I just hope with the points that I've made, my partner and the rest of the proposition, you hope to realise that, that a good dictatorship is far better than a bad democracy. I urge you to propose the motion.
Thank you very much. Well done. And I now call on the second opposition speaker from Team Dundee Strathclyde to speak, Declan Maxwell. Seven minutes, please. If I have a really nice car, and I mean better than anyone else's car, and I'm driving it, and it's better than anyone else's, but one day, without my knowing, I mean, I know it's going to happen, but I don't know the time or the place, it's going to explode, kill me and everyone in the vicinity, I probably don't buy that car. I probably buy the car, which might be a little crappier, but it's not going to explode and kill everyone. Our point here is that when considering cars or democracies or dictatorships, the long-term goals and what is going to happen in the future has to matter. First Proposition had to prove to us why bad dictatorships will not end in blood, or good dictatorships won't end in bloodshed or coups or the death of thousands, and they didn't. And they didn't do that for two reasons, which I'm going to explain. But before that, let's have six points of rebuttal. Like, just to clarify, we don't think North Korea is a bad democracy. We think that you have to have multiple parties within that, at least two. They might be like almost uh, mirror images of each other, but at least there's a choice. And we think that there has to be at least a little effect when you vote. Like, we think that that's not a high burden, that's not hugely contentious. We think that Kenya is probably a good example of this. Second point. Why dictators will necessarily always lose touch with the people. But what we think, even in their magical dictator, who's like a technocrat, we think that like, they get advice from multiple experts who disagree on things. Because they don't have any physical feedback system and just the reports of experts, they're going to lose touch with what the people actually want compared to what the experts want. And because the choice is made only by one person who has the power, and it's not an open debate where there's a vote, so the experts aren't going to be able to talk them down because they have the power. They're going to lose touch with the people and subsequently pass bad laws. Let's look at a good example of this. Assad was a very well-educated man. Assad was educated in the West, and I'm assuming he had lots of good advisers, but he lost touch with his people and subsequently gassed and killed them. I think that's relatively problematic when the only well-educated dictator I can think of ended up gassing his population. But let's say that their, their demonstration of what their good dictator is actually exists. Let's say the heavens open and an angel is a dictator. Why is that bad? Because they are still corruptible. Because they are still corruptible and they still have personal interests. And furthermore, because their successor is still corruptible. Like the fact that their response was they'll just have plans in motion for the successor is not a good enough answer. The successor is going to be the worst form of person who could curry the most favour with this, the current dictator and the subsequent successor is going to be that and you end up having a corruptible form where at the very end of it you end up with essentially Stalin. We think this is relatively problematic as we see the downward spirals generally exist in dictatorships, whereas democracies generally get better. If we look at our own country, that's very true. We started off with like, you know, the House of Lords, with the, the, the fusion of, of church and state, but we were able to work forward from that into a more democratic system, comparative to uh, like North Korea, which hasn't really changed much in like 60 years. Let's look at, all right, the fifth point, like, yeah, people are still going to vote, right, uh, sign up to everyone, like, Choices aren't always objective. They told us that we would have someone who would have the best objective opinion. Like, that's not good enough, guys. Like, this very building shows that objective choices do not necessarily always curry full agreement. The representation that some people want high taxes and low taxes, who both receive very similar education systems, who both have relatively similar objective knowledge, become to completely different uh, uh, decisions. I mean, that there is no objective truth, and people are going to choose things which benefit themselves personally, or for some sporadic reason they believe. But let's look on to our two points of kind of quasi-extension, quasi-deputy leader of opposition. I'm going to tell you why good dictatorships, even good dictators, necessarily collapse into bloodshed. The problem with what we got from my partner was that they have an over-powerful military. They have this because even in the best dictatorship, some people who don't know all the objective facts aren't going to be happy with the decrees of the objective technocratic leader. And in these cases, what happens is these people have to be controlled and put down. This generally leads to an inflation of the police services and the military because they can be used to show force and keep people in line. What also happens then is those individuals maybe get into your advisor board and get more unregulated powers. What happens is this becomes very problematic when, uh, when the dictator dies and you have an overinflated, extremely powerful uh, um, army. This generally leads to coups. This is what we see in dictatorial countries. The dictator dies and then the army kills the successor. We think that is most likely to happen in your technocratic government and because the long term it doesn't serve the people, we shouldn't support it and we should view it as bad. Furthermore, it's how the people view good dictators. Because they don't have all the objective facts, they view the state as the opposer. They don't understand 
understand why 5% tax is better than 10% tax, or 20% or, or tax is better than 10, or the police have to be here, or the distributions of the resources have to be this. They only care about themselves, and they see the state acting without any duress, any negative feedback. And in those cases, these people feel engaged by the state. Coupled with the fact that the military and the police are going to be powerful, they will be resistant to the state because they dislike the power of the military and they feel that they are oppressed. How, does this, uh, how is this problematic and why is this bad? Well, it disincentivizes people from believing in the government. So we, we will probably get some of our good left-wing liberal experts not advising the dictator on principle, which means we're going to get a biased, worse system. But furthermore, it makes political rest, un, un, uh, it makes political rest worse. Like, the reasons why we have riots and dictatorships is because he loses touch with the people. They lose touch with the people because they're disincentivized from engaging with the state because they see it as necessarily opposing to them because there is no feed feedback system. Furthermore, we feel that the bar I'll take you in a second, that the, the, like we have like the, our classification of dictator has to be like a good bargain system where they're able to keep things good for people or that like um, a long term alienation of an other people either within their country or, uh, or external to that. I'll explain why that is particularly problematic but please go. But we see, we see riots happening in our own country, in London. Thousands and thousands of people yes, thank you, sir. have been completely... The problem is, in our own country, we don't respond to riots One with AK-47s. The problem is, in our own country, we send out police and we have debates about whether or not rubber bullets or tear gas should be used. Because there's political discourse, more people supported the way that the police came down on it. If the London riots had been responded to with guns, we would have went out into the streets and joined them. Like, that's how the Russian dictatorial like, monarchy collapsed, because they didn't understand the people and they responded with violence and trusted armed men. Finally, the, all dictatorships re rely on part of the bargain principle or otherization. Either we are better than everyone else. This becomes problematic because they're unable to engage with other countries because they see themselves as necessarily superior. In that case, they don't engage in a political discourse. When that happens, it makes things worse for the people inside the country because everyone thinks they're like crazy and don't like them. See North Korea. Final point. Like, I, we didn't get a good enough response to the idea of ca uh, cabinet members and competing groups. Even in bad democracies, you have multiple small factions uh, which can compete and have to pander to specific things. Furthermore, you have a disentanglement of the legislature and the state, which leads to less problematic laws being passed and also a check and balance upon how the state actions. We think that proposition haven't proven to us dictatorships don't end, uh, don't end bloodily, and for those reasons, we can't accept them. Thank you. Many thanks. And a big hand to both teams. Thank you very much for your contributions. And can I now ask the first speaker from Team Madras St Andrews to open the case for the second proposition team, please. Seven minutes. Thank you, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chair. Today I'm going to talk about three things. Firstly, about the low information voter and temporal horizon. Secondly, about um, uh, the lack of accountability that comes with an illusion of choice. And thirdly, if I have time, about, I'm going to talk about the stability of um, good dictatorships versus bad democracies. Uh, most of my rebuttal is going to be integrated into my substantive. Before that, two just vague points of rebuttal. Firstly, we heard from opening opposition that um, the dictatorships require strong militaries and that eventually leads to their collapse. Well, the, wor the world's largest, strongest, most powerful militaries are with the U.S. US and all the other NATO countries as well, so-called democracies, right? And the inflation of police services that Declan was referring to, well, the U.S. currently has the highest imprisonment rate of any country in the world, right? And with the exception of the U.S., every single democracy in the world has historically collapsed. So this collapse isn't limited exclusively to dictatorships, which is what Declan tried to tell us. Second point of rebuttal, the, um, that a bad democracy eventually leads to a good democracy. We think that generally tends not to be the case simply due to One the nature minute. of a bad democracy. That a bad democracy allows an entre uh, entrenchment of power and a, deep, uh, and a deepening of the institutional factors that led to that democracy being bad in the first place, right? We can see, for instance, in Hungary, and pretty, much in, pretty much in all of the rest of Central and Eastern Europe, that, uh, which have effectively introduced dictatorial constitutions that have been condemned by the European Union, but they've introduced that under the guise of democracy, and they've done so in a manner that allows them to entrench their power, that very power that made it a bad democracy in the first place. Now, moving, moving on to my first substantive point, right? Um, like, in a democracy, no matter what type of democracy it is, good or bad democracy, everyone has the vote. Everyone has an equal right to vote. However, not everyone has equal knowledge, right? There's no civics 
prerequisite to voting, right? So, and, and that's because education levels differ vastly among the population. Now, if we classify the desirability of a decision in a country on a spectrum from one to 10, where one is the worst and 10 is the best for a country, we're eventually gonna have the desirability pulled down by low information voters, right? Simply due to the law of averages. And that's because the complexity of politics uh, and the wide ranging impacts of political decisions are simply too difficult for some people to understand who don't have sufficient educational backgrounds, right? Because people, um, at the most fundamental level, people have incentives to think only of the short run due to our biological nature, right? We think more of what's going to happen next year than what's going to happen next decade, right? Um, whereas people in position of power have, um, have the oversight to, they, they can see into the long run, which clashes directly with Declan, right? And however, in a democracy, even people who can see into the long run have to appease the short run, uh, have, to, have to appease the people who care more about the short run due to elections, right? Due to the fact that if they don't do so, they're eventually going to be booted out. So that results in a concentration of policies that concentrate far more on the short run than in the long run and results in actively detrimental policies, right? For instance, the right to bear arms in the US, which is, which is an amendment enshrined in a pre-Napoleonic constitution, but due to the fact that popular will stands against, um, stands against revoking the right to bear arms, no politician even dares to mention that they're ever going to um, take away that right to bear arms, despite the fact that it's been shown time and time again it would probably be really beneficial for the US to do so. Now, dictatorship, on the other hand, those who, those who rise to power generally tend to be the smartest people, right? They tend to be the most cunning. They, they know how to get there, which is an indicator of the fact that they tend to be very intelligent. They're able to, they're, and, and, and as a result, they're able to view more into the long run, right? My, my second substantive point, lack of accountability that comes with the illusion of choice. Because the current frame of thinking within democracies is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between our choices and outcomes, right? That we think, or most people tend to think, that elections represent an exercise of voting rights, and that a ballot is an expression of their desire of what to change. Now, let's just, let's just do a quick reality check here, right? And this clashes directly with Kira's POI. That there, there are four problems with this. Firstly, there's subconscious swing. Like, the brand of a party is more, uh, more likely to influence your decision. If a parents vote Labour, are more likely to vote labor simply due to the brand of labor, right? Secondly, there's a whole bundling of choices that comes with political parties which are entrenched as part of a democratic structure, right? In the, in the US, if you, want, if you want to be fiscally conservative, but you also at the same time want health care for all, you don't really have an actual vote due to the polarization that has come with the two bi-party system, right? You don't have a real choice. However, that's not the problem. The problem is that you think you have a real choice. Two more problems with this. Firstly, campaigns are frequently, as was mentioned in the talk, have financed by donors and who have a larger sway than you do. Um, um, and yet you still think, or most people still think, that they have an equal right because they, their vote counts equally, right? Despite the fact that these campaigns frequently come from those with the most money and power. And fourthly, power still is concentrated in an elite group of people who get elected over and over again, um, and that may or may not be representative of the people, right? However, people still go on thinking that because of the word democracy, they still have that choice. So there's an illusion of accountability that pacifies people. This illusion prevents, um, this illusion leads to people being unwilling to change the status quo, right? Because they feel what, um, because they think they already have um, that the, the, their leaders are actually accountable to them. Now, let's just contrast that with a good dictatorship. Because a di good dictatorship is only good if it has like high levels of education, right? That, that's what makes a good dictatorship. And in that sort of a dictatorship, there's much more de facto accountability than there is in a bad democracy. Because people know that they don't actually have an official um, choice when it comes to electing their dictators, right? And that's why dictators have to be wary of people rising up in revolutions. We saw that throughout the Arab Spring, for instance, when people actually get fed up with their dictators, they will eventually stand up to them and say, you know, enough is enough, right? And let's look at China, which is a very good example of a good, a good dictatorship right now. It's got economic growth. It's lifted 600 million people out of poverty, more than, a good more than a bad democracy would have ever been able to do so. And that's because the Chinese government has a fear of one billion people. Imagine a Chinese spring, not with a couple, not with a couple mil million, but with one billion people out in the streets. That fear is enough to keep the, uh, that dictatorship in power, and it's enough to provide that with some sort of legitimacy, right? We can also take the example of Singapore, which is a good dictatorship due to education, and yet has the world's most successful um, economic system. I'll take you, yeah. Given that your example of a bad democracy is essentially Britain, can you tell us how like, your conception of a bad democracy fits with the case we got out of first proposition? Like at all. No, no, 50 seconds. That, that's not necessarily what we're saying. Are we saying a bad democracy, any democracy can be good and bad on a certain spectrum. Once it passes an arbitrary point of being bad, we're trying to show that actually a good, a good dictatorship would be preferable to that. 
Because good dictators don't actually, unlike what Declan said, they don't actually have the incentive to lose touch with people in a good dictatorship. Because people like in Singapore, Singapore is a very good example of good dictatorship. People still do engage in political discourse, right? Politics is one of the major subjects in schools, right? And unlike what Declan mentioned, is an example of North Korea, that's simply not a good dictatorship, right? Last point about stability. Because what, what you get with a good, dictator, uh, a good dictatorship, you get a bit more continuity. And this clashes directly with Declan's POI as well. Because in a, in a bad democracy or in any form of democracy, actually, you get different parties who have incentives to differentiate themselves. What well, that results in is ping-pong politics and the policies going back and forth. This is, over, this is detrimental effects on real, ordinary people who, as a result of the uncertainty created by this politics, suffer from the and unemployment you must close now, sorry. and the fact that expectations are really important in the economy, right? Whereas, now look, let's look at Singapore, one of the most attractive destinations for foreign investment uh, anywhere in the world, a, a really good dictatorship. And the other thing that um, this, uh, this ping-pong politics results in is voter apathy. And let's, look, let's just look at what, um, what, that, what that's led to in Hungary, for instance, um, where back-and-forth politics has resulted in polarization and people getting sick of politics, and that's resulted in a far a right-wing party, a neo-fascist party by the name of Yobik, actually gaining 17% of seats in Parliament. I'm That's afraid you must Africa close now, please. So for all these reasons, ladies and gentlemen, we are very proud to propose. Well done. Well done. And we now, thank you, we now move to the first speaker from Team Bears Den, Glasgow to open the case for the second opposition team, please. Seven minutes. Almost as if by magic. That's my introduction. Thank you very much, honoured judges, ladies and gentlemen, deputy providing officer. Uh, so, as the great Bob Dylan said, the times, they are changing, but not on side proposition. We are going to give you two points in extension in this debate. The first point is why systems of patronage used to maintain stability in dictatorships are first inherent in dictatorships, especially in the long run, and second, why they're so particularly problematic in terms of maintaining long-term stability in those societies and a maintenance of the, the concern for human dignity in those societies, and second, why we say systems of dictatorships, notwithstanding that patronage system, are inherently violating of uh, the concern for human dignity we think is so important and we think that democracies can deliver. Um, first, a lot of One rebuttal. Minute. So um, we could ask in this debate what a bad democracy is and what a good dictatorship is because they're probably important to get clear. We were told by first proposition that states that don't uphold democratic principles are quote unquote bad democracies. No, they're not democracies. So, I mean, if China had votes which, which you could only ratify the rule of the Communist Party, it wouldn't be a bad democracy. It just wouldn't be a democracy. It would probably be a bad dictatorship. The fact that Russia today reports that 100% or higher of people in Chechnya vote for a man who is described in Dagestan as the butcher because of his actions in the Second Chechen War means Russia is probably a bad dictatorship and therefore falls out with the scope of this debate. We were told that Singapore is their, good, their example of a good uh, a good dictatorships. Singapore is a multi-party democracy. You might think that Lee Kuan Yew's People's Action Party is somewhat overly litigious, but the fact that they do have multi-party voting and people keep on returning the People's Action Party doesn't mean it's a dictatorship. It's probably a good democracy. We're willing to take the example they gave you of Italy under Berlusconi from first proposition as probably what they do mean as far as a bad democracy. So there's a, uh, it's a society in which there's crime, in which there's inequality and social conclusion, in which because of the accumulation of capital and the, system, and the way in which that undermines the true function of the democratic state and therefore mitigates the ability of that state to uh, ag aggregate preferences, we wouldn't say that might count as a bad democracy. Uh, we're willing to concede North Korea is probably a bad dictatorship. Um, as far as technocracy goes, which is the definition they wanted to give you, we have a couple of problems. So we were told by Matteo that the technocracies are better able at meeting preferences of the voters. We point to the fact that presumably any definition of a democracy is going to be intrinsic that the democracy involves at least some preference aggregation of the people at the bottom. Matteo cannot simultaneously have you believe that techn technocrats are, one, better able at meeting those preferences which democracies inherently meet, and two, simultaneously subject to expert advice and institutional memory. Presumably, that institutional advice and that institutional memory 
if it has any function in this debate whatsoever, uh, uh, gravitates against the kind of preference aggregation you'd get in a democratic context. We say that, in fact, what you don't have is you know, expert advice. What you have is what the experts believe is the people's preferences. You are subject to the expert bias effects that have certain institutions of you know, academics over time thinking that there is a particular way of doing things, the particular status quo. What you then actually have is stagnation. You don't have the dynamic responses you get even in the worst democracies because you have no ability of people outside the academic elite who are setting the agenda to have any kind of change uh, to the way things get things done. We say that if they want to talk about the comparison between Mario Monti and Silvio Berlusconi, they want to look at what happened in terms of the public reaction to the technocratic government. We say that the people of Italy reacted negatively towards the, the government because it didn't feel the need to explain its actions and the necessity for those actions in terms of you know, budget constrictions upon uh, the people and the consequences for that people. The reaction is the rise of people like the Five Star Movement under Giuseppe Grilli, who is like two shades left of being a fascist. And we say that fundamentally that means that long term, democracy and stability has been damaged in Italy by even the short term period of technocratic rule. We say that the fact that uh, we're willing to concede to them dictatorships are better able, the best dictatorships, at achieving stability and market performance. Because obviously, trivially, the Chinese government is better able at promoting the market when it can bulldoze neighborhoods in Beijing in order to host either the Beijing Olympics or alternatively the regional headquarters for some multinational. We say, though, that those are probably bad things because we want to value things like the property rights of the people in Beijing, even if they happen to be slum dwellers. And we say that that's something that dictatorships intrinsically won't deliver. We were told that don't worry about the transition because there will be plans in place. Uh, Mr. De uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I, I don't need to tell you that the best laid plans of mice and men gang after Glay. We say that the problem is that the, 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 the patronage networks, which tend to be intrinsic in running these states, means that that transition is always going to be unstable. You don't have to be an expert in Scottish history to know that every time there was an infant monarch, there was at least two civil wars. First over who ruled the infant monarch, and then second, when the infant monarch came into his ascendancy, but, uh, a war between himself and his own steward. We say the the problem there is one in which the patronage system which was inherent in monarchies and in dictatorships is one in which is inherently unstable. Why is that patronage network so intrinsic? We say that even their technocrats need to use systems of patronage to maintain control because they don't have the popular appeal that goes inherently with being a democracy. We say even in democracies, even in the most corrupt ones, you still have to distribute power to some degree that you don't have in dictatorships. Nasser started in Egypt as a good dictator, but by the time we got to Mubarak, because all the institutions of state power had been placed in people who were, you know, safe and experts, it meant that the, the uh, military in Egypt controlled 80% of the state. It meant that it was in, impossible for people outside the state patronage system to get any kind of control. That means everyone else within that state necessarily had to co-opt themselves into that patronage system. But why is that patronage system so damaging in terms of transition? It means either the person you get in charge is the person within that system who is, you know, the guy who was better able to navigate the system, like the people that rose to the top in the, in the Soviet Union, were the minute. people who are bureaucrats, who were academics. They weren't people who had any necessary connection to the people at the bottom of the system. And we say that the second, the alternative is you have a rival faction within that passion network or right with it who necessarily have to fight and it almost inevitably becomes a civil war because it is literally a life and death struggle because if you're out with a passion network that happens to prevail, you don't have any resources. See you know, the history of civil wars in Scotland. We say that, that systems of dictatorships inherently violate human dignity. What do I mean by human dignity? I mean the ability of someone who to extend their self ownership to the state in which they happen to live, to have some ability to at least believe they have some say. Second, op second op proposition said, oh, well, but, you know, they don't necessarily really have some say. They can't necessarily really come to the fore. We say that, you know, even in states such as the United States of America, there is at least some, uh, there, there is some possibility that in the long term you'll be able to make power. We say that the, the fact that the corruption has become so, so embedded in the American political system has caused things like the Occupy Wall Street movement to come up. It means that someone like Bernie Sanders is very likely to make a run for the president. It means that the alternative now, please. is likely to come to, to the fore, where we say in dictatorships, necessarily, even if they don't control the, the, their state by this, the force of arms, they need to set up things like the Stasi, or they need to set up information controls like the Great Firewall of China in order to control the flow of Im information. That means I don't know who I would be with that system of, of dictatorship. I don't know uh, who I, 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 I become subject to a false consciousness where I don't actually understand the nature of my oppression, and I actually become my own jailer. We say that is intrinsically worse than a situation where where even if you were in a corrupt democracy, at least you knew who you were and you knew the democracy around you was corrupt. We say that people in the dictatorship, the most stable ones, the most successful ones, tend to be their own jailers. We say that's intrinsic value of, uh, violation of human dignity. And if it wasn't, when you transition from one Let's dictatorship close, to another, please. it tends to be the case that you're subject to civil war, and civil war tends to be bad. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much.
I now call on the second speaker from Team Madras St Andrews to conclude the case for the proposition. Ewan Redpath, I believe. Uh, seven minutes, please. Thank you. Um, I have identified two points of clash, uh, the failings of democracies and the benefits of dictatorships. But first, I have three points of rebuttal. The first is on Singapore, which, despite what the previous speaker said, is in fact a dictatorship. It has authoritarian law uh, that is not chosen by the people. Uh, the second point um, of rebuttal is the previous speaker said the transition in dictatorships is always unstable. But just look at China. It wasn't too long ago that the once in a decade transition of power from one dictator dictatorship um, to another happened. It was peaceful, it was well organised, and it's stable. Uh, so that's clear evidence that transition in a dictatorship can work well. And to my third point of rebuttal, um, we talked briefly about the London riots, and uh, the speaker who I addressed about it um, said that if the London rioters had been mown down with guns, um, then we would have gone onto the streets, followed them, and revolted. So is that not an admission uh, that if... Um, a dictatorship becomes oppressive and violent towards its people, the people will throw it out. This is the sort of check and balance on a dictatorship that my part, uh, partner talked about, that dictatorships fear revolution, so they will try and please the people uh, which um, they dictate to. Yes, please. I think you find that uh, dictatorships in all walks of life are, do fear revolution and uh, because they fear revolution therefore um, up their military power and start to uh, physically oppress the public. Is that really what you want to be uh, promoting here? Uh, that would be an example of a bad dictatorship. But what we see is it's perfectly possible for a dictatorship to handle these things um, well and if it doesn't it's very possible for it to be chucked out. Um, for example the uh, Soviet Union uh, when it was um, it was eventually chucked out by its people. Um, so to my first point uh, of clash, uh, the failings of democracy. Um, well, what my partner talked about was uh, the ill-informed vote of people making bad decisions. Uh, this is what democracy leaves us with. Uh, it's regrettable that people can't always make the right decisions. Uh, in, an, in an ideal world, everyone would be well informed. But at the end of the day, the role of the state is to protect people. And if the people themselves threaten that, then the state should deal with it. it at the end of the day, it has to do what's best. And that is what a good dictatorship ensures, uh, ch with the um, checks and balances of the possible revolution. Uh, yes, please. Given that the experts the dictators are relying on are also people, also fallible, and also probably ill-informed, can you tell me why these group of ill-informed, fallible people are better than a larger group of ill-informed, fallible people? Um, people who have conducted... Well, for example, if we had scientists conducting climate change policy, we'd probably end up with a lot better climate change policy than uh, many politicians have given us, uh, because they know... Um, they know their subject. It's simple. Often what you end up in, um, with de in democracies is people who are good at getting elected, good showmen, um, good speakers, um, not people who know what they're talking about, not people who know what to do. And often what we see the ministers um, being the forefront of um, huge government departments um, and how many civil unelected members of the civil service um, sway government policy uh, despite being unelected? Do you really know that the education minister in Westminster is, is the one making the decisions or some unelected civil servants behind him? To my second point of clash, the many benefits of a good dictatorship. Well, as I've already said, the possibility of revolution uh, is always present in a dictator's mind. It keeps them in check in a good dictatorship. Uh, for example, China. As my partner said, China is a brilliant example of a good dictatorship. It's lifted millions of people out of poverty. It's, ed it's uh, instigating education programs that sweep across the whole country. Infrastructure, things that people need, schools, hospitals. 
And it's doing this because it doesn't want the 1.3 billion strong Chinese population to revolt against it. It knows that its power is fragile. And that is the ultimate um, guarantee that it will act in its people's interest. Uh, we've also heard from the other side um, that dictators bribe their citizens, like Saudi Arabia apparently, um, with money from oil uh, that is, is unsustainable. Uh, but for example, Ed Miliband, uh, a part of British political life, um, is offering to freeze your energy bills. Is that a bribe to the uh, population? Some might argue that it is un un unsustainable, uh, but is that, it's essentially the same thing. They also said that the dictatorships will always get worse. But we see that this is not the case. For example, I cited again, China. China is getting better and better. It's getting more open, um, more free. We see with this, uh, as I mentioned before, a new uh, government, a new top council to China has come in. And with it, we're beginning to see change of uh, more freedom. So we can only expect that within, in the next 10 years, when the new government comes in, they will be even um, open, more open, uh, offering more freedoms than the one before it. One minute. Um, we've also had this idea that di dictators will be well educated. Uh, yes, please. Okay. Dictators fear their citizens only insofar as they can control them. That's why they set up oppressive state apparatus of surveillance like the Stasi or control the information that flows to them about the way that their things get things done. And the inner party end up internalizing an attitude of contempt for these people because they see them as lesser than, you know, the few anointed who actually get to make decisions in the long run. 30 seconds. Uh, well, again, that would be an example of a bad dictatorship. It is not unimaginable that we could set up a dictatorship um, in which... Um, the government can never get too powerful in which citizens are always well informed. Um, they keep citing these bad examples of bad, horrible um, dictatorships, uh, but that's not what we're discussing. We're talking about a good dictatorship, uh, one that can respect the people. And um, Let's close now, please. ultimately, I think we've shown that is better, far better, than a bad democracy. Thank you, and I beg you to support this motion. Thank you very much. And I now call on the final speaker from Team Bears Day in Glasgow to conclude the case for the opposition. Uh, Max Cochran, seven minutes, please. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will be closing the case for the proposition and indeed uh, the final debate today, which I hope we can all agree has been a fantastic day. Um, and certainly I am as much as honoured as the first proposition speaker to be speaking here. Um, I'm going to move right along. Um, rebuttal will be um, uh, part of my um, substantive case throughout and I will att attempt to identify uh, the main points of clash and ultimately why the proposition have failed um, to describe this motion in enough detail and ultimately why this motion should fall. First of all, um, I would like to uh, attack what seems to be the main, the main argument for why um, a bad democracy is as such, why it is bad. And the main, uh, the main point across the board seems to be the, the lack of knowledge that contributes. Not everybody um, appears to be knowledgeable enough. They don't, the proposition don't appear to think everybody has um, the, the decision-making capacity to make um, choices in their life. However, we in the opposition understand, and what we think that the proposition have not understood, is that by taking that choice away from them, by um, retracting that from them, by supposedly giving it to a smaller number of people, you are, some, you are promoting a complete lack of knowledge. The, the public no, le no, no longer need to know anything. So we see we have gone from a, um, a small lack of knowledge, which ultimately could be fixed, to absolutely no knowledge. No, thank you. This seems like um, uh, the main harm at which I wish to start off my case, and indeed the first point of clash. Um, uh, the proposition have um, told us about the role of the state and ultimately why a dictatorship is better. And um, I found clash with this um, basically on the intrinsic properties of dictatorships and uh, how dictatorships go about achieving stability. Uh, maybe in a second. So first of all, um, uh, we see that the intrinsic properties of uh, dictatorships include such things as media control and monitoring the public to the point 
of um, complete lack of privacy. And um, we, see that we see this as a ma many harms, as my partner has already pointed out, um, uh, and uh, the proposition have failed to realise is um, uh, these, these aren't intrinsic of bad dictatorships, these are intrinsic of all dictatorships. As we've heard from the, um, the proposition, dictators fear. Um, they fear the public, they fear revolution, and so they, must, they try to do things to prevent this, such as um, constant monitoring, lack, complete lack of privacy. This is the only way that they can control the public to that extent. Yes, please. Do you actually believe that the monitoring that the US conducts on not only its own citizens, but also six billion people throughout the world is any better than a dict dictatorship's monitoring? And secondly, you said we're going to go to no knowledge. No, we're actually going to go to better knowledge because the leaders in a dictatorship are likely to be smart. That's how they got there in the first place. No, I'm, I would completely disagree with your knowledge point. I think we're talking about the general public. We're not talking about the panel of experts that you have appointed. And uh, on, on that point um, about uh, intrinsic... Um, uh, we, yes, I agree that uh, monitoring does take place, but we see this that in dictatorships. It is 100% guaranteed as this is the only way that they can possibly um, control their subject. This is the only possible way you can keep a dictatorship running. So now I will move on to um, uh, my second point of clash, which is around how, how does a dictatorship establish stability? And um, we see that a good dictatorship could indeed be stable, but it goes about achieving stability in all the wrong ways. Um, uh, firstly, we see that to achieve stability in the first place, you must have absolutely no rebelling, no, um, uh, no arguing, and i.e. total agreement between, um, uh, throughout your whole public. And as I've already said, um, this, is, it does, this doesn't leave any room for thought. This doesn't empower the people. This doesn't give them the incentive for knowledge. Um, uh, this doesn't give them incentive for knowledge, which is really an important part of our society, the fact that we can go and learn. We can go and find out more about the world. This is what dictatorships lack, ladies and gentlemen. We see that the only way they can establish stability is to, sit, um, is to create this sense of false consciousness, this sense of 100% um, agreement throughout society, which simply does not happen. We in the opposition understand that everybody, every single human being, and all of you in this room are different. You have different opinions on things. You have different philosophies. Therefore, um, uh, no thank you, we have um, you have different philosophies um, uh, that you can discuss. In a dictatorship, this aspect is taken away. There is no discussion in the general general public, as the proposition seemed to feel um, that an expert of panels can do the job well. We in the opposition completely disagree. Um, we feel that it, um, uh, people are forced then into dictatorship to internalise their conflict, internalise their own arguments, which ultimately leads to more harms. Um, uh, they, they un, they, it leads to an unhappiness throughout society, it leads to an unproductiveness throughout society, because ultimately people feel oppressed. This is simply what happens, this is intrinsic to human nature when they are not given an opinion. No thank you. Now, we've also heard um, uh, from the proposition about the transitional periods and about um, how, how well it would run, how, how much better it would be than a bad democracy. In fact, I believe we had from second proposition, um, sorry, the second proposition speaker, it would run like clockwork. There would be plans already in place. Now, we see this as a major harm, as what they've essentially outlined there is there will be no change throughout this. No, thank you. There will be absolutely no change in their definition of a good dictatorship. There is absolutely um, no compromise. It simply does run like clockwork. We see this in society, in a political system, as very bad. As um, we've already outlined today, no, thank you. Um, uh, this leads this can One minute. to corruption. This simply leads um, to dictators losing touch with their people because the people have no say, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't matter how you frame a dictatorship. The people don't have a say. This leads to them feeling oppressed and also an inadequate feeling of power um, uh, given to that, ex that expert panel of judges. We've already... Um, they receive no negative feedback. I thought that was um, an important point that the proposition did not pick up on. There is no negative feedback towards this good dictatorship, which ultimately leads them to think they are always right. As I've already stated, every single person is different. Every single person um, is new and has new ideas. Therefore, when we say the right decisions, when the proposition says the right decisions, they are vastly overgeneralizing. There isn't a right decision. We need discussion in our society, ladies and gentlemen. We need everybody's voice to be heard. This is not what this motion is proposing today. This is not um, what a dictatorship proposes today. Um, we think that even a bad democracy now, gives please. mechanism for change. A good dictatorship, no matter how good, does not. 
And ultimately, this is why I beg you to oppose this motion. Thank you very much. And I would like now to thank all eight speakers for their contributions to the debate, and perhaps we could have a round of applause for everyone. Well done. And if I might now ask the judges to leave us to deliberate on what will be a very difficult decision, I know. And if you'd be good enough to return in 15 minutes, we would look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. And we'll now move on to the debate on the floor, or what we might call the open debate here in Parliament. And the floor debate will last for 15 minutes, and I will invite speakers from the floor to raise points in relation to the debate and points you have just heard. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand. And if asked to speak, you should wait for the red light to come on at your microphone. Stand, tell the chamber your name and the name of the school or university before you raise your point. And I'll just draw to your attention, these are directional microphones which you can move about and they should be pointing at your mouth. And that way we'll be able to hear everybody's point. Um, I would also invite you to give short contributions or ask questions of the speakers. Teams can choose to answer the point, but their performance is not judged against their responses, or teams can choose not to answer, whatever suits you best. Remember, though, there is a prize for the best floor speech of the evening. So, we now have the first contribution, please. Young lady over there, white shirt on. Katrina Renison, um, Linlithgow Academy. Um, this is directed at both teams, but probably more the opposition. Um, would you not agree that in a bad democracy, the popul populace is very likely to become disillusioned, so therefore, eventually, at some point, it can be assumed that the only people that would vote in such elections in a democracy are those who agree with the status quo? Therefore, rather than a bad democracy eventually, as the opposition seemed to suggest, eventually resulting in a good democracy, instead it would eventually turn into a bad dictatorship, as the extremist effect would be condensed through elections to a point where the democracy is annihilated and we are left with a bad dictatorship, which is, seems to be agreed on both sides as the worst possible option for a country as a whole. Thanks very much. Uh, can we have another young man in the black top in the middle? My name is Daniel Joffe, uh, Craig Monk High School. So, uh, first, a question to the proposition. Do you believe that a brilliant dictatorship would be better than a good democracy? And to the uh, opposition, do you believe that there is any kind of weird hypothetical circumstance in which a dictatorship could be better than a democracy. Wish to answer? Anyone wish to answer? In that case, we'll move on to the next point, please. Um, I'll answer right. the second part. A zombie dictator, uh, a zombie apocalypse. That's probably my answer. Thank you. Right, uh, lady, in the young lady there in the red jacket, please, with blonde hair. I'm Florence Dean, and I'm from St Margaret's High School. Um, the proposition have repeatedly said that they're referring to a good dictatorship and not just anyone, but George Orwell has considered various different political governments and has proven that there's flaws in any dictatorship. So you've said that a good one's going to consist of someone who's well-educated. Well, Hitler certainly wasn't well-educated. He wasn't smart. He failed university. He failed to become an architect. So that is therefore an invalid point. And so I ask you, what does a good dictatorship consist of? Do you wish to respond? Yes. I would say a good dictatorship is something like China, where the regime, the people in, pa um, in power, uh, do listen to the people, although we may find that very hard, that a, a system other than a democracy can listen to its people. It does. Um, the politicians in China uh, have enacted huge change for the benefit of everyone. Um, I would say that is a pretty good um, dictatorship. Thank you. Next point from the gentleman here in the white shirt near the front in the middle. Um, Martin Close, Bucksburn Academy. Uh, which system of government is it's open to each team? Do you believe would provide the most equality in a society for its people? Who would like to respond? Yes, gentleman over here. Uh, 
consistently with my case, I would say democracy. Uh, I think that a dictatorship on any level depends upon the otherization of some other people within that, within that group. So when you look at any kind of dictatorship, they generally uh, uh, maintain themselves by, by, by putting themselves as in opposition, direct opposition to another group, either internally or externally. So although you might classify like China as a good dictatorship, they still like prioritize themselves um, by looking at like Han Chinese comparative to other uh, ethnic minorities and, and even ethnic majorities within that country, uh, and, and you know the continual hate of Japan. Um, so I would say that the best way to get any form of equality would be through a democracy based upon like the ability to legislate independent of the dictator. Thanks very much. Um, would you like to come back in as well, gentleman in the blue shirt? Yes. A quick response to that. Um, I personally think that uh, a democracy can ensure um, equality, um, given that certain institutional factors are present. But at the same time, if democracy is applied in its purest form, it's a bit like uh, two wolves and a lamb deciding what to have for dinner. Um, obviously, it's not going to be the wolves, and obviously, the lamb is going to be overruled. So, um, but there do have to be certain institutional factors, and that factors can frequently come about by good dictatorships as well. I'm going to stop you at that point because I want uh, members from the floor to contribute. Uh, young woman with. There we are. Thank you. My teacher's still awake. Uh, yep, that's fine. Okay. Um, I just like to Catherine, make a point. Catherine. What was your name? Catherine Cranston. Cranston. Um, I'd just like to make the point that I think that the use of the word good and the use of the word bad has been very confusing to me because especially with something like a democracy or a dictatorship, it's words like good and bad can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I'm, I really don't think that there's... Uh, that it's not been very well um, put across by um, the debaters. So... There's no such thing as a right or wrong opinion. That's what we tell little kids, okay? That's what we tell children. There's no such thing as a right or wrong opinion. But, of course, what other people think of the opinion is a different story. But William Shakespeare said that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So I say that correctness and incorrectness, that rightness and wrongness, and um, goodness and badness, I'll stop now, is in the eye of the beholder as well. Um, so if you're going to use the words good and bad, you need to make sure that you explain exactly what you mean, which I don't think um, anyone's done effectively yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, who else can we have a point from somewhere over here? Young lady over there in the middle. Yes. Your name, please. Um, Emma Arkandakis from Whitburn Academy. Um, this is for the proposition. You talked about how getting a good dictator who will make um, the right decisions and choices is the way to go. But if it's so, so simple, then why hasn't this been done before? Surely no country is like want to put in charge uh, like a sociopath. It's not what they plan to do. If Germany knew how Hitler would turn out, or Libya knew how Gaddafi would rule, then I highly doubt they'd be pushing these people forward. Thank you very much. Um, someone from the middle. Yes, you at the front. Yep, Green Jersey. Um, hi, um, my name's Amber Feeney. I'm from Wellington School. Uh, this is for the opposition. You guys mentioned that you couldn't find any uh, dictators that ruled successfully. There's a small country in Europe called Turkmenistan, and it was ruled by Sarapia Minrat Niazov for 15 years till 2006, until his death. There was no riots in Turkmenistan, and it went to the point where they started calling them His Excellency. So, that, yeah, I'll just put that point out there. Thank you. Yes, of course, yeah. Um, it should be pointed out that he's the person who chose to be referred to as His Excellency <laughs> and built a very large statue in the capital. Um, it's also the fact that, you know, the West tends to use Turkmenistan for most of its torturing needs. Um, so whenever you read about extraordinary rendition, the place they're being rendered to tends to be Turkmenistan, which means if you're in one of Turkmenistan's torture pits, you probably don't think it's a particularly good dictatorship. Many thanks. Um, another point from a gentleman over there with a check shirt. 
Uh, hi, Owen Mooney, Glasgow University. A question specifically for the opposition, and probably more specifically Duncan, because he mentioned in his speech about patronage. Like, in bad democracies, where it tends to be dominated by corrupt political parties, surely patronage is exactly the same problem there, just as it would be in the dictatorship? Like, that's still the only way to advance in these sort of corrupt parties. Like, even in good democracies, there is still a certain amount of patronage in political parties. And, like, so doesn't this lead to exactly the same problems with, like, unstable and bloody transitions, like you saw this in the collapse of most democracies in Central Europe throughout the sort of 20s and 30s, precisely because the democracies were so bad and this patch thing was still a problem, they all inevitably collapsed into bad dictatorships anyway? Many thanks. Uh, yes. <laughs> and thank you for the, that brief response. Um, gentleman at the very back. Yep, you, yes. Story from Bearsden Academy. I didn't hear your name again, please. Kieran McCrory from Bearsden Academy. Uh, I'd like to make this point to the proposition uh, who the best example of a dictatorship they could think of was China. China has various human rights abuses. Uh, their industry causes more damage to the environment than any other country in the world per head of population. And if this is the best dictatorship that you can think of, then I'd question what, how any good dicta dictatorship uh, is better than a democracy. Thank you very much. Uh, another point, uh, if no one wishes to respond, I prefer really to take uh, more points to get as many people in as possible. Gentleman at the back. Uh, I'm Greg Ritchie from Stuart's Marble College. And I think that, you know, a good dictatorship can be better than a bad democracy, because I think in some sense a good, a good dictatorship could be defined as policies that are reasonably moderate and therefore that the people don't actually want to overthrow the people, even though they're the dictatorship. While in a bad democracy, there's kind of this, the abuse is still happening, it's more subtle. But because it's an illusion of democracy, people don't actually want to overthrow them because they think they are in a democratic state, even though abuses are still being placed. So because they believe that their views are being heard, even if they're being abused, they don't do it because they believe they're in a democracy. Many thanks. Um, young lady over here. Um, Eleanor Matheson, dear Linlithgow Academy. Um, I think good and bad is relative to a similar case, and in this situation, that would be similar countries, well, other countries. Something classed as a good dictatorship is only ever going to be good when uh, is only ever going to be good when it is seen to be and perceived as better than other dictatorships which already exist. But as we know, there are several dictatorships which have been unsuccessful. Who is it who decides who these? Um, if a dictatorship is to be good or bad, the dictator himself or the people under the influence of this said dictator. Because if it is the dictator labelling their government as good, this is hardly a reliable source. Following this train of thought, the, people, the said people living under this dictatorship may not feel comfortable expressing their true and honest opinions in fear of the reactions of the dictator powering them. So, um, therefore, when they say it is good, this may not necessarily represent their true opinions. Also, people completely out with this country can hardly make an informed decision because of the many biased attitudes that often surround politics. And I'm sure you will agree, unless you have lived somewhere, used their hospitals, their education, and experienced interactions with their government, you can hardly understand a country. Thank you. Um, right, we're going to the other side. Yes, gentleman at the back. Uh, my name is Ethan Martin. Uh, just a point for the opposition. If you look throughout history, you'll find a lot more successful and stable empires and therefore dictatorships than you will democracies. Take, for example, the Greek city-states and the Persian Empire. Now, we tend to think of the Greek city-states being saintly and democracy-loving and the Persians as totalitarian, mainly influenced through the, best, the blessed few of us who sat through the film 300. But in actuality, the Persian Empire was uh, slightly more dreamy. Like, there was a good uh, mail system delivery. Um, captured territory were allowed to keep their uh, rulers, which is why you'll often hear the Persian ruler referred to as the King of Kings. Uh, freedom of religion was tolerated uh, in an unprecedented fashion, which is why 
the ruler Cyrus Great got really good press in the Bible. Uh, meanwhile, the Greek city-states, particularly Athens, range from flawed democracies to complete dictatorships. For example, this is, let's remember that these people are where we get the word democracy. And the government in Athens was notoriously corrupt, citizenship was limited to males, and slavery was running rampant. And in the end, Greece wouldn't embrace democracy, good democracy, until 1974. Right, thank you very much. Um, someone from the middle, uh, girls along here in the middle, please. Um, Amy Oakes from Whitburn Academy. Um, this is aimed at the third proposition speaker. You said that everybody can vote, but not everybody can vote, young people can't vote, and I myself cannot vote. Shouldn't we, be talking, shouldn't we be taking smaller steps to improve a bad democracy, such as improving political education or lowering the, lowering the voting age to raise the number of votes, rather than change our whole political system, simply because voters are apathetic? Thank you very much. Um, gentlemen at the back, and I, I now want people who haven't spoken before, please. Uh, Duncan Hollins from Jordan Hill School. Okay. It was earlier said that uh, a, div a dictatorship will eventually form into a good dictatorship through fear of an uprising or of people disliking the dictatorship. Well, this is not the case at all. Take North Korea. If you wish to go there as a Western journalist, you have to travel with a government, uh, someone from the government from North Korea, and they will arrange the meetings that you go to and these people will be actors or will be so scared of saying anything bad that they will cry because they are so happy to be Korean or that they love their dictator and they love what they've done for them when you can quite clearly see that they are not happy. And if they do not do this, they will then subsequently be seriously punished. So it is out of fear that these people lie and, it's out, and the dictator gets his way every time. Thank you. Um, next person is the gentleman with a bow tie here in the middle. Thank you for recognising possibly my most distinguishing feature. Um, I would uh, just like to, to make a note, if I may, that uh, I myself was brought up in uh, a benevolent dictatorship, I like to think, in, in, in a nice little country with, which was divided into two states, mum and dad. Um, and uh, moving on from that, I, I would like to uh, just put it to you that, um, given that given the recent scandals and so on regarding uh, lobbying and so on and so forth, even in a democracy, do you not think there is some degree of dictatorship? And are we not doomed to dastardly dictatorship at some stage of our lives? Thanks. Um, um, young man with the specs there. Um, Pull your microphone towards you, yep. Good one. Uh, Jack Williamson from Linlithgow Academy. Um, this is to the second speaker from the proposition. Do you not agree that dictators may have a, uh, have a people's views at heart to begin with, but um, they lose, but they lose this, uh, what, they, they lose this quality when the power gets to their head, like uh, the Russian Tsar or the German Kaiser? Any thanks? Do anybody want to answer that point? Yeah, what we're making as the point was that... You have to speak to the microphone. Sorry. Um, what we're making the point was that it would be a good dictatorship and that the dictator would not lose morals and would stay a very truthful person, and that's what we were trying to distinguish the difference between a good dictatorship and a bad democracy. Many thanks. Um, young lady with black hair in the middle. Hi, um, my name is Parnian Sadeghi. Um, it's fine, don't worry about this. Um, basically, um, I, would, um, I would kind of posit that despite the fact that we want to look at it at, in abstract, dictatorships around the world make their citizens live in fear, and this, this fear is in exactly as crippling as opposition wanted to make it seem. The fact of the matter is, after any protest, there is a massive uh, backlash and um, like 
crack down on any kind of dissent and any kind of like journalism and writers and these people go to jail and their families never hear from them again and they get tortured and when they get out of prison nobody ever dares to speak again and this is a problem with dictatorships and this is a problem with people like him actually saying my mom and dad are dictators um but, oh, sorry. Um, uh, basically, my problem is that um, while we want to see like um, things like um, China as being good things, the problem is that they send their citizens, uh, like for example, uh, the artist uh, Al Weibe, to uh, like uh, torture uh, prisons. When they come out, they can't speak again because of the fact, and they can't express themselves. And this is exactly the problem that we have today: that citizens are so afraid that they're personal relationships with their arts and with their families are like broken down and that is the human dignity that we are talking about. Thank you. Did you just tell me your name again? I'm afraid I didn't catch uh, it. Penny. I go by Penny here. Pen Penny, right. Um, young lady in the middle there. Thank you. Caitlin Sutherland from St. Mark's Academy. Um, the kind of issue I had with the idea of this be, uh, benev uh, benevolent dictator, this kind of idea of a good dictator, is that the, any well-meaning, well-educated person um, can be uh, instated as this kind of benevolent uh, dictator. That doesn't mean they're going to remain so. Because people are, human beings are fundamentally flawed. People, um, when they're left unchecked, cannot be relied upon to remain like a benevolent dictator. Um, and if we see time and time again throughout history um, that power corrupts, then why would we allow anyone to have any form of absolute power over a, a large group of people? Many thanks. Um, young lady here, I think. Me? Um, you, you, the proposition used China as a good dictatorship, but many years ago, the Chinese government, when the Tenement Square incident happened, had the Chinese government hide the situation. They didn't let it be exposed on the internet because it looked poor on the country's like public. Like it looked poor on the public. So how exactly is hiding the fact that the Chinese government ordered for many of its civilians to be good, killed a good dictatorship? Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to call on the young lady of the specs there, please. Um, my name is Taylor Hege from Whitburn Academy. I have a question for the opposition. At the moment, Sri Lanka are in a crisis because their leader discriminates against the human rights of their citizens, yet he still claims to be a democratic leader. This is a prime example of a bad democracy. Surely if a well-educated dictator, such as one described by the proposition, was in charge, then the correct decisions would be made and Sri Lanka would not be in the 25-year human crisis that they are. Many thanks. Um, where are we going to go now? Young gentleman up at the back in the grey sweater. Grey. Um, Connor Harmel, St Marcus High School. This is a question for the third proposition speaker. You said that um, you said about democracy that the same people, the same group of people, keep getting elected over and over again. But surely, if it's a democratic country and people have the right to vote, they've got the right to change that. Many thanks, and we'll go to over to the other side this time. Um, Jen, um, person with the specs. Uh, yes, young man with the specs, please. Yep. Is, oh, Liam Cassidy, Balfour High School. Uh, this is a question for the first speaker from the opposition. Um, Adolf Hitler was a bad man, but he was voted in technically legally, so he, this was a bad democracy. So are you saying that um, although he had his pros, he got Germany out of his money troubles from the World War, World War I, are you saying that... Um, the pros outweigh the cons, and that um, Hitler is better than a smart, clever dictator leading their country for the better. You wish to respond? If so, you want to respond, go on. 
Um, like our point was that you have to consider the long-term harms, and we think like Hitler wasn't elected a majority; he was like 40 percent, and he seized power by kind of brutally murdering a lot of people. I think that quite puts him in puts him in the stage of, of dictator. Like he also imprisoned communists within his own country. Uh, there was the night of the long knives. Like there's a lot of examples where a, a, a bad democracy became an even worse dictatorship because of like uh, he was a bad guy. Like I don't think we have to defend him as as being like. A bad democracy, based upon like our, our standards of. Right, I'm going to take two more questions, and then we'll suspend until the judges come back. The young lady there, blonde hair. Johnson from Douglas Academy. Uh, I think, aside from the merits of either system, uh, democracy or dictatorship, the very act of like slapping this label of "you are a dictatorship" onto a country does disincentivize all the individuals in that country from participating in or like engaging with um, how that society is run. So. The fact that we could actually create this good dictatorship is in fact incorrect, incorrect because the aim of a government is to um, create kind of like is to meet the needs of the people and the needs of the people are to be sort of well educated and I don't think that we could um, that you could educate a populace well and maintain a good dictatorship because ultimately there would be an uprising in people so the idea is somewhat paradoxical. Right, many, many thanks. Um, and we'll take the final question from a young lady at the very back of the specs. Uh, Rachel Bruton from the Lithgow Academy. The second speaker from the proposition said a good dictatorship would be run by a dictator who had high mor morals. But how do you decide who has high morals? Because morals are quite subjective. And if eventually the morals that a dictator needs were decided, then how can this person ever become a di the dictator if there is no way of voting them into power? Many thanks. And I think at that point we will now stop uh, for a brief suspension before I announce the overall winners. OK, thanks very much. And thank you all for contributing to the debate. Um, can I just have a conversation with Ruth Davidson, please? I gather you're going to sum up on behalf of the judges. Would you like to do that before the results are announced or after? Before. Well, in that case, I would now call on Ruth Davidson uh, to sum up on behalf of the judges, after which I will announce uh, the decision of the judges. Ruth Davidson. Well, 
I believe I've got three minutes, and you're going to bring my remarks to a close. Is that right, Deputy Presiding Officer? Most certainly I will. <laughs> OK. Well, first of all, I'd like to give a big thank you to everybody that got involved in today's event. This has been a great event. It's been running for a number of years, and I think that the standard gets higher every single year. It's fantastic to see this chamber being so well used by people who aren't elected politicians, but who I hope one day will be elected politicians. And you don't need to look too far round this chamber on a sitting day to find lots of people who've been doing both schools and university debating before they get into Parliament. So, um, you know, it is great and a real privilege to be an elected member in this chamber, and I hope that many of you consider that uh, as a potential uh, future opportunity going forward. I think when it comes to debates where there's a very broad uh, motion, it can be quite difficult for the people who are either proposing or opposing the side of the argument that runs counter to what you think the natural received wisdom in is. But it does actually give you quite a lot of latitude to have a bit of fun with it. So while most people would think that all dictatorships are bad, being forced to argue for them makes you think a bit harder about what you want. And I think some of the best speeches I've ever seen in debates down the years have been by people who are proposing the legalisation of incest, who have promoted child labour and who've wanted to privatise the mineral rights on the moon. So, I mean, there really is a lot that you can do there. And some of these I'm going to be writing into our next party manifesto. Um, I think... The guys on the proposition really took hold of that and ran with it. And some of the things that we had today talking about bloody and violent revolution being a check and balance uh, on a government, uh, only dictators having uh, access to experts to advise them uh, and voters being too stupid to know how to vote. I think we're all uh, points which were open to challenge and were challenged in, uh, or not challenged in, in many different ways. And I think in terms of examples we got from the, the opposition too, there was a, a real imagination there running us through things like Scottish infant monarchs to snowballs running down hills and cars blowing up at some unspecified time in the future. So I would absolutely commend both sides in the House of some of the illustrative examples that you brought to this debate today. I thought they were excellent and I know that the rest of my judging panel were impressed too. One thing that we would encourage more of as you go forward in your debating career is the first part of that, the word debating. Points of information, making sure you give them, making sure you take them. And once you've sat down after your speech, making sure you stay part of the debate. This isn't public speaking. This is about the cut and thrust, getting right in amongst it. And even if you have a point that you, you might not think is, is you know, stellar, sometimes the point at which you make an intervention in a debate, if it's just at the point when somebody's coming to the last minute, that can be tactical too. You know, this is a contest. This is sport for unfit people, or that's how I always looked at it when I was debating. Uh, so, you know, this, this really is a contest, so you want to be involved in the cut and thrust. But that said, I thought uh, today's uh, final debate was an absolute credit to the competition. Um, I've never seen... Uh, any other uh, debating uh, sort of on the circuit that involves taking people at different stages in their career, school and university, and pairing them up. I think, by and large, that's worked. It's worked very well. Uh, I think that we want to see a bit more of that. Uh, and I think that, that all of the four teams today should be very proud of themselves, as well as all of the teams that were competing during the afternoon. And I would like to thank everybody for their participation. So thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> Many thanks. And I'm now going to come down to the lectern and announce the prizes. OK. And so, the first prize goes to the best university speaker of the day, and that is Declan Maxwell, from Strathclyde University. Thank you. Nothing's left to chance here. We've got crosses on the floor as well. Now, the second prize goes to the best school speaker of the day, and that is Max Cochran from Bearsden Academy.
The best contribution from the floor goes to Parnian Saida from St Andrews University. And after a well-fought final, the runner-up of the 2013 St Andrews Debating Championship goes to Madras St Andrews, uh, Ewan Redpath of Madras Academy and Mira Regan of St Andrews University. And so to the winners of the 2013 St Andrews Day Debating Championship. And that goes to Bears Den Glasgow. <laughs> of Max Cochrane of Bears Den Academy and Duncan Crow of Gl Glasgow University. That concludes that part of this event, and I will now invite uh, John Dye uh, on behalf of the English Speaking Union uh, to come forward and say a few words. John, please. Thank you. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd just like to say a quick few words on behalf of the English Speaking Union. and. Um, First of all, can I just um, offer my uh, congratulations to the, the winning team this afternoon and indeed all the teams in the final for giving us such a lively and interesting debate this afternoon. I just want to say a few words of thanks just to, to round off the day. And first of all, can I just thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and your parliamentary staff for allowing us the use of the parliament today and indeed this chamber for the final. You know, I'm very aware that this, the chamber is used very infrequently for non-member debates and we're very privileged to use it and it does give the whole event a certain gravitas, so thanks, thanks to you for that. Secondly, can I thank your parliamentary team for all the hard work that goes into organising today's event and there's a lot of logistics and background work and a lot of meetings that, that take place in the run-up to today, so thanks for all the arrangements which I believe have more or less run like cl clockwork. Um, well, as much as they ever do on a day of debating. I um, can also um, just thank uh, Ruth and my fellow judges, Kez, Stephen and Andrew, uh, for judging the final today. Uh, and indeed all the judges, and I know there's other judges out there who've, who've judged the heats, and you know, we, they're the unsung heroes that make this, this event work. Um, and also, can I just thank the, my team at the English Speaking Union, um, Ian Duncan, Simon Christie and Suzanne Ensom, again, for all the hard work they've put in, uh, both on the day today, but also in the run-up today with all the, the, the organisational work. And, and last but not least, I would just like to thank um, all of the competitors who are here uh, this evening uh, for coming along today. You know, it's really you that make this event what it is and such a special day. Uh, uh, and I hope you really enjoyed yourselves. This is the seventh year that we've run this, and you know, I, uh, this, this event was instituted when I was chairman of ESU Scotland, and I have to say I continue to be really proud of it as, as an event, and I hope whether you're a school pupil or a, a student that you get the chance to come along and take part again next year. Here, here. Well, 
Thank you very much, uh, John, for your very kind words. And I would just reiterate again what a great pleasure it is to have you here today and to be able to hold this uh, debating final here in these buildings. On the script, it now says, can I invite everyone onto the floor for a group photograph? Does that mean all the contestants or does it mean absolutely 130 people in the debating chamber? The finalists. Thank you for that, Andrew. So, it, the last thing that remains for me to say is thank you for all your efforts. I wish you a safe journey back to, from wherever you have come. And if you'd be good enough to follow the events assistance as you leave the chamber, then everything will run smoothly, absolutely, to the end. So the winners would just like to come on to the floor, all the contestants.